Well, I want to welcome all of you to this inaugural uh, version of this vlog or this podcast, which is known as Conversations About Leadership Matters. Uh, we're doing this in response to a number of our uh, subscribers uh, to this blog, which are, is, is past 15,000 now. So uh, people are interested in the topic we're talking about, and they're, they're really interested in being able to, to uh, hear from others and to hear from others who've made a big impact uh, in their sphere of influence. And one person who's made an enormous impact in his own sphere of influence is one of our alums, uh, is a friend and colleague of mine, uh, is uh, the Honorable Roy Buell, who is mayor of Dubuque, Iowa. And uh, he is our first guest, and I'm just so happy that he's, he's agreed to join us and subject himself to this, uh, this opportunity. And, and Roy, I'm just, thank you for agreeing to do this and welcome, welcome to this vlog. It's my pleasure, it's good to be with you today, Jeffrey. You know, you and I have known each other a long time and, and um, one of the things we talk off and on about, we talk about politics, we talk about our, our stories, our histories and one of the things that, that I've learned over the years in talking with alums uh, is that every alum has a story. Uh, every person has a story. So just tell us a little bit about your story. How did, you, how did you get to this point? Did you come out of the womb wanting to be mayor of, of Dubuque? Or how did that happen? No, uh, my story, uh, I'm a native Dubuqueer, so I uh, was actually born here in the city of Dubuque. And, uh, when I was 18 months old, my father left our family of, uh, there were seven children and my mother, and uh, I was the second youngest at 18 months old. And my grandparents, uh, who lived in the north end of Dubuque in a, a small graystone home, uh, took us all in, and that's where we were raised. Uh, we grew up in that home, uh, actually didn't leave there, you know, until uh, we got married, and uh, each of us. And Wow. wow. You know, I... During that uh, time, I can remember a lot of organizations in the city of Dubuque. Uh, you know, one that comes immediately to mind is the Salvation Army and all of the help that they gave our family, uh, both as individuals and as organizations. Uh, and, you know, I've never forgotten that. And uh, when I became an adult, you know, I always thought about someday uh, giving back to the community that had given us so much. And then, uh, my lovely wife, Deborah, said, uh, you know, maybe you should run for city council. You always wanted to give back, you know, and this was back in uh, 1995. And, and I said, well, I'll, I'll look into that. And it was a, a very brief look. And uh, I decided to run uh, right before the, the uh, nomination period closed. And I won that election and uh, really dove into to city governance and how uh, you know, it can do things to help uh, citizens of the community, and and uh, it's really become a passion for me over the last uh, 20, almost 24 years now. Well, that's <laughs> that's a lot of service, and we'll want to talk about that. But you, you talked about being, that your grandparents welcomed you into their home. I mean, say more about that. I mean, how, how old were you at that time? Well, I was 18 months old. I had a younger brother uh, in my oldest sibling, my oldest sister, uh, was about 12. So uh, my grandparents, who at that time were 57 years old, uh, took us into their small home. Uh, there was literally a bathroom that had about a three foot square open space, you know, between the sink and the, and the toilet and the, the bathtub. And uh, if you can imagine, uh, we had four siblings, there were four sisters, and uh, it was always a struggle to find timing, you know, to get into that bathroom. So I think that's how I learned to get up early because my mother would knock on our door at quarter after five in the morning from the time I started in kindergarten uh, all the way through until the girls were out of the house anyway so that uh, we could get in the bathroom before they took it over for the last uh, hour of preparation. So uh, but it was, uh, you know, there there wasn't a lot of uh, extras, you know, in, in the in the household, but we always were fed. Uh, I learned to uh, cook and bake starting at the age of five. I had my first garden in the backyard 
when I was five years old, a little three foot square space that I planted some corn in that I had enough for maybe a half of a, a cup of kernels when I was done that I actually ate that, uh, that summer. I remember <laughs> that. But, uh, you know, there, there were always neighbors, uh, friends, organizations, as I said, that, uh, you know, helped us out. I got my first baseball glove when I was 12 years old, along with my brother. And that was uh, provided by a gentleman who drove a, a semi truck for the uh, feed company that my mother worked at. And, wow. you know, she uh, she worked her entire adult life, uh, you know, into her 70s, I believe. And, you know, it was all, uh, you know, to, to help make sure that we had a good, solid footing, you know, that we could go on in life and, and be successful. So, I mean, that's fascinating. What 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 did you Clearly, your grandparents, your mother were important influences in your life, and, and that was a, I mean, I'm trying, to, I'm about the age of your grandfather when, you know, so he's, I'm trying to visualize this. He's at, he and your grandmother have raised their family, they're thinking about retirement, they've got a home, and suddenly that all changes, and, and right. it's turned upside down again. I'm just... What can you tell us about your, your grandpa and grandma and, and your mother and clearly their big influences on you? What, what did you learn from them throughout this entire process? Well, my grandfather, um, you know, as long as I knew him, he worked. He passed away at uh, 72 from, from cancer, but uh, he went to work every day. He was a, a welder, a boiler welder at the uh, Dubuque Boat and Boiler Works. My grandmother, you know, took care of the house. Uh, she basically uh, was the one that was home all the time when we would come at different hours from school or whatever it was. Grandma, grandma was the one who was there uh, when we were on those odd schedules. Uh, my mother worked um, into her 70s as well. And, uh, you know, she didn't have transportation some years. And, you know, she would use the bus uh, to get to and from work or whatever other means uh, she could find and uh you know they were they were always focused on the children you know my siblings and i and, and our success and i think uh they tried to do what they could to make sure we had what we needed uh we went on a vacation every summer uh, usually to my other my uncle in uh, st louis and uh they always made sure that we had the basics you know what we needed and uh took us to church religiously, uh, you know, doing all the things that they could do to make sure that we were uh, going to be good adults and uh, contributors to our community wherever we, we would live. They, I mean, they just sound like absolutely amazing people. They were. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to meet them. Maybe someday in heaven, I hope to meet them. So I know, I know they're, I, I know they're there. We're still working on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, clearly, Clearly, I mean, there are elements of, of, I know you well enough to know that as I hear you talk, there's elements of that formative experience that translates into some of your convictions about leadership. Now, you've, you've been involved in leadership positions uh, in our community for 24 years, so that's that's a long time. <laughs> well, yeah. it, uh, it is, you know, based on uh, you know history and what other people have, how long they've served. Uh, I'm the longest serving council member and the longest serving mayor, but uh, you know, I learned a lot of those uh, those qualities, you know, of leadership and of working hard. Uh, while I was in school, uh, I can remember a lot of the, my leadership uh, abilities, I think, started when I got into athletics. And uh, there were some coaches in seventh grade that inspired me to uh, get into athletics. And uh, I actually uh, ended up uh, at senior high school. Um, you know, I was the quarterback of the football team and played basketball, uh, ran track and Every one of those coaches that I had, you know, from seventh grade on was always encouraging and, uh, you know, talking about uh, the future and what would you like to be. And, you know, it takes hard work to get to achieve that. And so I always had that 
that little push behind me, that nudge behind me. And I learned how to uh, work with others, you know, and, and work as a team to get things done. And I think that has served me uh, to this day, you know, that the successes that we've had here in the city of Dubuque are all based on teamwork and working together and having a plan and, and not looking so much at, at today as at the future and, you know, what kind of a place you're trying to create uh, for others. And so I think it's, it's all been uh, very uh, helpful and formative, you know, making me uh, what I am today. Well, I, you, uh, you mentioned the word teamwork and that I imagine for many of our, of our listeners, teamwork and politics don't necessarily seem, uh, certainly if we're basing our impressions on the nightly news or what, what's happening in DC, it has been going on for years. Teamwork and, and politi politics don't seem to go together. So how, how, do you, how, how do you do that? How do you lead in such a way that you can, you can be a team as opposed to a my way or the highway uh, type of approach? Well, you know, in, in Dubuque, uh, we do something that, believe it or not, is is uh, not done everywhere. It's it's uh, unique to cities that are successful, and that is we engage citizens as partners in all of the big decisions that we make. Uh, I I can remember all the uh, the big projects we've had: the B Branch project, the redevelopment of the Millwork area, you know, our water. Uh, and water pollution and control facilities, uh, all of those big projects that we've done while I've been on the council have had tremendous amounts of input from citizens and businesses. And, and so it's really, uh, you know, working as a part of a team. Obviously, it takes, uh, you know, some leadership from different organizations, individuals to make that happen. But in the end, it's all about engaging those citizens as partners and uh, making sure that their ideas, their thoughts are included in the process. And that gives uh, them buy-in into the success of those projects. And, uh, you know, it just kind of feeds on itself. You know, if you include them, they always know that if there's something big coming, they're gonna be a part of it if they choose to be. And then they back uh, the finished product. And uh, we've been very successful in doing that and planning with our uh, Envision uh, 2000 project, uh, it was the original one when I first uh, got on the council and that we worked on, and and we've had uh, those every you know five to ten years since, uh, so that we are current. We know what citizens are looking for, and uh, we all work collectively towards those goals, and that's that's how the city council has functioned since I've been on it. Yeah, I well, it's functioned very well, and and I think you're being also very gracious because I know a lot of a lot of the citizens in our community, as do you, and I have to admit that we're not always the easiest to work with. So, how, you know, I I'm sure that you know what I'm talking about, but uh, how do you? Yet we're all citizens, and I I think that has an application locally and uh, across the state and at our federal government, but I, I kind of we're in an environment, I think, of we, they, us, them, you know, either or. Mm -hmm. And it, it strikes me that that if that's where we continue to be as a as a as a culture, it doesn't end very well. And and I've always admired the way that that you've led the city and and I, I don't hear a lot of either or language. I mean what Am I on track there, or, or I mean, how do you respond to that? Well, it you know it comes down to where government is functioning and functioning well today, and that is at the local level. Uh, in any city uh, in the United States, the work is being done at the local level, and that's where things are are happening. That's where they're occurring. Obviously, we need uh, you know help and assistance and partnership from state and federal resources, but uh, you know, when it comes to the decision making and the decisions about what projects are important, uh, you know, what projects will make the city a better place for future generations, most of that work is being done at the local level. And uh, you know, it's, that, that's got to change. You know, there's gotta be more of that uh, 
collaborative spirit uh, in our state governments and in our, in our federal government. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how we're going to get there. Uh, I keep hoping that uh, the best practices that cities are creating, you know, in the cities that are successful are ones where different entities work together. I, I think that hopefully will have an influence long term on people, uh, the voting public who vote for people to represent them and you know, maybe they'll start asking more questions about, well, how are you going to cooperate or partner with the other party or, you know, an organization that doesn't necessarily agree with your your opinion? But uh, right now it's, it's almost solely happening at the local level, and uh, we're just very fortunate in Dubuque that we have a lot of partners uh, that collaborate with the city, and, uh, and uh, we have a lot of planning that's in place so that everyone has the opportunity to voice their opinion, uh, you know, their desires, you know, uh, give those uh, to the people that represent them, and, and we make decisions based on that input. You know, I, I really do. I have to commend you. We've, Dana and I have lived a number of places across the country, as you know, and, and uh, the, just the really the collaborative nature of the council and the way that we observe all of you working together. And clearly, you know, we all have differences of opinion. I'm not suggesting it's a uniform, but there's, there's, there's always an element of, of at least feeling like people are heard. And uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to describe it, but as a, as a person, I can, I can tell you I, I know it when I experience it. And I think we experience it a lot in, in this community. And, and it's amazing the number of friendships and connections that you can develop with people just from, just on a basic human level. It, it, and we, we've got friends across the political spectrum, across the theological spectrum, but just on a, when you know somebody and take time to listen to each other and really listen, it changes the nature of that relationship. I mean, is that, do you experience that as mayor? Is that, is that an important part of what you do? Well, I, I do experience that, and, and I can give you a, a great example of, uh, you know, people are coming from disparate backgrounds, different backgrounds, and yet uh, working together for the common good. And that's uh, the organization I belong to, you know, the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, you know, other than the, the big city mayors who run on a party basis, I honestly could not tell you the uh, political affiliation of most of the other mayors. And uh, that's because, you know, we're working on common issues in our cities, uh, trying to come up with best solutions. And that's the conversation that, that carries the day. It's not about uh, what political party you belong to or what your philosophy is. It's how do we turn best practices into uh, a project in our city that will make it better for our citizens. And uh, I think, you know, there used to be a day, I can remember, I'm old enough, uh, you know, when when political parties didn't agree, no, they never will agree on everything, but they could come together around common issues, you know, and, and work together to make them better. And, uh, you know, we've just, we've got to get back to that day. I mean, that uh, that is our, our democracy at work, and today it's, uh, I, I think that we are somewhat at risk of, you know, throwing that all, all away if we don't uh, come together and, and work for the common good and and uh, make it work for everyone. Because, uh, you know, we, we've shown, you know, in the city of Dubuque and uh, Conference of Mayors and the Iowa League of Cities and the League of Cities uh, nationally, uh, they're all doing that. and. Uh, yeah, but that's local leadership again. You know, it's, we've got to get the get our state and federal leaders to uh, come together in a similar manner and try to work on many of these big issues that uh, we all need to resolve. Yeah, yeah. No, I I agree, and I I can't imagine anybody would disagree. And the minute I say that, I suspect <laughs> I, sus <laughs> I suspect yes, you, you'll find someone that will. <laughs> But when you think about it, so we, we're kind of a microcosm, I guess, of, I think, of what could be uh, in terms of decency and civility that can also translate into, you know, difficult conversations, uh, difficult processes, but that are translated into um, 
things that matter. And, and mm -hmm. when, you, when I look at, at our city and our community over the last uh, two and a half decades, I mean, it's just, it's been a metamorphosis, a complete transformation. And, um, and I won't even go into all the different projects that you and your colleagues have been involved in. Uh, but I am interested, I mean, when you look ahead, you know, a good leader is always looking ahead and not just around the corner, but the next corner. I mean, what do you see? What are, what are the things that keep you awake at night? That's always kind of a fun question to ask people. What, you know, what, what, well, what keeps you awake as you look at the future of our city? Yeah, I, 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 you know, our city really is, is one of uh, many in this uh, country that I think share the same concerns. And, you know, it might sound uh, like an odd concern to have, but uh, for me, you know, in my, my campaign uh, running on sustainability as uh, the mayoral campaign in 2005, you know, I, I made the statement that the next five years would be, uh, would decide the next 50 years for the city of Dubuque. And uh, we made some big decisions uh, around sustainability that, uh, you know, have really benefited the city of Dubuque, our, our uh, water resource and recovery center uh, that at that time, you know, was a lot of new technology, but has really proven to be a, a boon for the city of Dubuque, uh, self-sustaining, literally produces its own energy, and and uh, the water that comes out of there is actually cleaner than the water that uh, gets pumped into our system. So uh, things like that that are, are, I think, are really going to determine the success not only only of our cities and our states in this country, but globally, is how we're going to address climate change and the human element uh, related to that. Because that, uh, that, I think, is what's driving these drastic, uh, well, I know it's what's driving these drastic changes in our weather. And all of those weather changes are creating tremendous problems for cities. Uh, so I, I think uh, if we, really try to get a handle on uh, our sustainability in our, in our cities and provide best practices to reduce uh, carbon emissions and uh, create clean water and uh, just an overall clean environment that reuses and reduces and recycles as opposed to just tossing. Uh, I think that is absolutely critical to future generations and, and their success. And I think you would hear that from from every mayor and city council uh, in this country. And uh, yet it's not the policy in many regards, uh, you know, at the state and federal level, which is really uh, what we need to bring along to make this uh, viable. And uh, every every other country, I think, in the world is, is working hard to reduce that. And, you know, we've got to get back to that, uh, that task and uh, really do what we can, because that's going to really, I think, determine every city's success going forward, and uh, that does keep me up at night. It, uh, I think about that quite a bit, uh, but I'm happy with what the city of Dubuque has been doing and, and in many ways uh, creating replicable models for how to deal with things like stormwater and, and uh, you know, our, our wastewater and recycling and you know, all the things that are going to mean a lot uh, to future generations. So when you talk about the human element of climate change, those are the kinds of things you're talking about, the, the, the practices, the, the discipline that we can do individually on a, on a small basis, but when multiplied over 60, 70, 80, 100,000 citizens translates into a meaningful impact. Is that, is that what we're talking about? Well, that, that's a big piece of it, but uh, you know our, our city is doing a lot of things that uh, you know with big projects that are, that are making a huge difference. Uh, the Bee Branch flood mitigation project, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, that's beautiful. Stormwater issues in our city, you know, health of our citizens because uh, you know they're not having to deal with mold and flooding, and it's cleaning the water. Uh, it's much cleaner water going into the river, you know, than comes out of the river. Yeah. yeah, water is, what, what do they say is, is the policy people that water is the new oil of the 21st century, so clean water. It is. I think of all the, of all the water on the face of the earth, only 2% is fresh water. Yeah. 
Well, that that's a problem. That's a, that's a that's a challenge. So, what do you? I mean, you've had an enormous number of successes uh, as as a council, as a mayor. What what's your biggest disappointment? I mean, sir, we all have disappointments. What can you think about? What your biggest disappointment is? Well, that's that's hard. To, <laughs> that's hard to come up with something in the city of Dubuque. I mean, so many of the things uh, that citizens have brought forward you know, as, as uh, their top 10 priorities, you know, in, in their envisioning processes, many of them have been accomplished. But, uh, you know, there, there's never enough funding, enough resources, you know, to do all the projects you need. I would, I would think if there was one thing that I'm disappointed in, and uh, it's not because for the uh, a lack of trying or, you know, putting uh, money and funds and, and uh, partnership efforts towards it. It's uh, the poverty level, I think, uh, you know, in every city in the country, but for, you know, for me, it's local and, you know, it's, it's uh, way too high. Uh, now, granted, we get a lot of new citizens into the city of Dubuque, you know, from other communities. They come here to try to create a better life and I can really relate to that, you know, with my background, I know how, how uh, hard it is when you don't have resources. And uh, in our case, we had the resources, not only provided by our family, but, uh, you know, by organizations and individuals in the community. But there are so many now, you know, as opposed to then that uh, are in need, that don't have the educational background, uh, you know, the that come from places that were not the easiest places to live. And we're trying to create a, a place of opportunity for those people where they can uh, get some re-education, some retraining, uh, get a job and, and uh, start to work them and their family members uh, out of poverty. And that uh, there's never enough resources, you know, to put toward that. And I, I think that is, uh, you know, one of the things, not only the city of Dubuque, but I think every city in the country uh, needs to double down on and and hopefully get some help from state and federal uh, government, you know, to, to look at best practices and make sure that they're expanded upon in communities so that we can give everyone an opportunity, you know, for a hand up and uh, try to get them a better quality of life and so that everyone can, can share in the successes. What what can we do? What can just regular people do to help that? What can we do to help in those in those situations? Is are there things just regular citizens uh, who aren't involved in, you know, in public service? Are there things that we can do to to help with? You call it a hand up. What what do you see in in your whole constellation of engagements? What do you see as opportunities? Well, you know, there we have a lot of volunteers in the city of Dubuque, a uh, tremendous number. And uh, there are different programs that, depending on your age, there's uh, senior volunteers, for instance, that do a uh, reading in our schools. I'm not there yet. Yeah, you're not there yet. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, they're, they're very helpful, you know, uh, with helping kids read. Uh, there's our VISTA, Vista volunteers uh, that are tremendous assets in the, in the community. They do a lot of work with people of lesser means, you know, to, right. to help them. There's different organizations, the community foundation, a lot of programming, you know, to help those, uh, lesser means, uh, our, our, uh, our community college, you know, that has a retraining program, right. uh, in things like welding, uh, computers, those types of things that people can get education, at a, a pretty good rate, you know, not, not a real expensive uh, because it's subsidized, but uh, just opportunities that can help them, you know, those who want to give them a hand up. And uh, there's just volunteers that I think in most churches in this community, uh, most organizations, most groups uh, all have programs that in one way or another are trying to help those of lesser means. It comes down <clears throat> in many cases to dollars and cents and the resources that are uh, available to those groups or those individuals. And uh, that's where I think, you know, as a city and state and federal government, you know, we could provide more resources to those programs that have proven to be successful, that have proven to be beneficial, you know, to that uh, population. 
and uh, it's just a, a lack of, of dollars and cents right now uh, you know to make them put them on the scale where we can actually get done what needs to be done uh, you know to make an effective change that i i hear that i hear that and i'm i'm thinking now i'm as i'm kind of trying to process this i'm let's see i'm reminded of the fact you graduated from the University of Dubuque, you had a long career uh, with John Deere. And if I recall, uh, while you were working at John Deere, you also went to school and you were also raising a family. So, I mean, you had a lot going on. Clearly, you don't lack for energy. Uh, what, what year, now what year did you graduate from the University of Dubuque? Uh, 1992. 92, and I'm guessing that you weren't an in economics major, because if you were, you would have known that your compensation in, as mayor basically translates to about a quarter, about 25 cents an hour, maybe something like that. So right. you're-, you're well, I was a business major. Yeah, okay, <laughs> so you knew, you knew what you were getting and, into. And so, I did not run for mayor uh, not knowing how much I was gonna get paid, believe me. I, I learned uh, quite a bit in that, uh, in that program and uh you know I, I use that now to my benefit you know serving as mayor and uh yeah. you know it's come in uh it's absolutely critical you know to have that kind of education uh right you know and, and uh, serving the position that i'm in there's just a lot of uh a lot of business acumen you have to know well and i think roy i mean you're not going to say it but i'll say it for you it's a labor of love for you uh, it really is i see that in you and and I, I think that's something that, that all of us can, can do. We all, you know, they're, they're, it's a passion for you. And it, it really, uh, I'm not trying to embarrass you, but it, it really plays out in your leadership. And, and you know, I'm, I for one, and I know I speak for many of us, are grateful for that passion. Uh, one of your other passions that our listeners might not be aware of uh, is that you have a passion for for aesthetic beauty uh, in many ways, but particularly in the area of landscaping. And uh, you also have been with the university. We were talking the other day. I can't believe it. I think it's 17 years since you've- 17 uh, years. Good heavens, what has happened to the time? I, I don't know. But <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, I don't feel any older. I yeah. might look a couple years older than I did back then, but- uh, you know, I, I guess it's, uh, you know, when you have a passion and you really enjoy what you do, uh, you know, time really isn't relevant. It, uh, you know, it goes by a lot quicker than you'd like, but, uh, you know, I've not, not done anything in my life uh, work-wise, well, what some people consider work. I consider landscaping as uh, relaxation, but, uh, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed it. Uh, you know, my wife will tell you I don't, I don't sleep a whole lot, so I have to have something to do to keep me busy. <laughs> and that, that's my relaxation at home as well. I mean, I love going outside, uh, you know, in the winter, shoveling snow. It doesn't really bother me too much. Well, we get, I mean, as you know, we get lots and lots of compliments about just the beauty of our campus and how it's landscaped and, and, and taken care of. I mean, I've said to people, if you look at the, uh, the mulch around the base of the trees, somebody, those are perfect circles. I mean, who thinks that way? They're perfect, yeah. they're perfect circles. And, but yeah, that's, but that, uh, you know, I, uh, I've always told my, my staff, you know, that everything matters, you know, it's the little things that, uh, people notice, you know, the, the candy wrapper, you know, that's blowing in the breeze or the, the pop can that's sitting in the, in the gutter and, so you, I know you've seen, uh, you know, the, the grounds crew around the University of Dubuque uh, stopping when they're driving down the street and picking up a, a bag or a piece of right. trash, you know, along the way, throwing it in a bucket that they all, almost always have in their gator. And that's because, uh, you know, I, I tried to instill in them that, you know, if everyone just drove by those things, we'd have a much different looking campus. And it, everything matters, every piece of paper and you know, every uh, kind word, whatever it might be, everything matters uh, in an institution, at an institution like the University of Dubuque. Yeah, it, well, it's really apparent. I mean, the way, uh, you know, I, I get, 
We were having some, actually some architects were on campus a couple of years ago, unbeknownst to us. They were, they were eventually bidding on a project and had, had come just to sort of get a sense of the place. They, they looked a little lost. They didn't even ask for directions. They looked a little lost. And one of your colleagues noticed that they looked a little sort of absent or, or unaware of where they were or lost. And so uh, he initiated a conversation with them, introduced himself, told them about what he does, asked if he could help them to get to where they needed to go. And not only that, he stopped what he was doing and walked them uh, to, to the place they were looking for. And I, I mean, you know, as a president, uh, you just can't, you can't put a price on that. I, that tells you that people are invested, that they care about what they do, they care about the mission of the school. And, and in that way, it's, it's, it's more than just about flowers and grass and it, 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 it does, doesn't it? The, the landscaping of the place signals uh, an attitude of either invitation and care or an attitude of, oh, we don't care and, and therefore you shouldn't either. I mean, is that part of what, it seems like that's part of what you're getting at. Well, that's, uh, you know, we actually hear those things from, uh, from parents. Our staff has uh, both physical plant and uh, the ground staff that uh, they, they, they've made the comments that, well, if you take care of your grounds this well and the buildings, you know, are always clean and, and kept up, I know you're going to take good care of my suit or my, my son or my daughter. And uh, we hear that a lot. Uh, we've also heard from different uh, uh, parents that, you know, they, they weren't intending to visit the University of Dubuque. And they drove by. They saw the beautiful campus and the buildings, and they just had to, to take a visit. And I know we've had students enrolled at the university that uh, their parents uh, were some of those that uh, noticed and and uh, stopped to take a look. And, you know, it really, uh, it's about providing quality uh, of life amenities, you know, for people that we care about the most, uh, that we're trying to help the most, and that's the students that are on our campus. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And thanks for what you do uh, for our community. And I, I think it's only appropriate that as mayor, you should have the last word here. So we've got uh, lots of alums that are listening to this, uh, are watching this, and you'd be surprised, but many, many, many of our current students uh, are listening. As you know, we've got students from 44 states and 27 different countries, but a lot of them stay in our community. Uh, when they graduate. There are wonderful opportunities for them here, wonderful companies, wonderful nonprofits, educational institutions, uh, public education, parochial education. There just really are, are limitless opportunities uh, for vocation, for employment, for enjoyment. What would you, what would you want to say to those students as, as mayor and uh, as a lifelong uh, a member of this community? Well, first uh, of all, I want to thank them uh, for selecting uh, to go to school in the city of Dubuque uh, and at the University of Dubuque. And uh, we have a lot of jobs here for them. I hope more of them uh, decide that they want to stay. Uh, we get a lot of new people coming to our community now to fill the jobs that uh, we have here, the vacant jobs. And, and when I meet with those groups, I always tell them that they are some of our most important citizens because they bring a different perspective from anyone else who's lived in the city of Dubuque like I have my entire life. Uh, they bring a lot of new ideas, a lot of new uh, enthusiasm to this community. And uh, certainly, I know uh, many of the students at the University of Dubuque and the enthusiasm they have, not only for the, the school, but for the city of Dubuque. And, I'm just so very grateful uh, that they've selected Dubuque as the place they want to go to school, and I certainly hope that uh, we can entice more of them to call Dubuque home long term because they uh, they really do represent a big part of our future here in the city. Yeah, I agree, and and you know, as you know, I'm around uh, those students a lot, and uh, you are. Yeah, it's a it's a transformative experience for them here. They're they're. Uh, they are the future, and uh, but 
but you and your colleagues have really worked together to create an environment that they want to invest in. And that is, uh, that's not happening in a lot of places, but it is happening here. And I think you and, and uh, your colleagues and, and all those who, who think about these things on a daily base or basis are really to be commended. So I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for, you know, for your contributions as, as mayor, uh, for your contributions to us as a, as a colleague here at the university, but uh, just for the example you're setting for uh, those of us who are connected to the university and to our alums uh, who are scattered across uh, the country and across the world. And it's, it's been a privilege for me to be able to just chat with you a little bit about what you do and, and uh, you know, God bless you in, in your remaining years of leadership and I won't even say remaining years of engagement because I know you're going to be engaged for a long, long time. So thanks, Roy. Thank